Everybody's watching the Web 3.0 and crypto space saying, hey, what are the next hot trends that can attract the next big wave of users? Because, you know, as crypto experiences these boom and bust cycles, it's highly correlated to new exciting technology hitting the space that gets people really amped up to try new things. And in this video, I'm going to talk about a trend that I'm seeing form right now inside this space that could be a part of the next big wave of crypto adoption. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know in this video. You know, as a blockchain developer myself who works this technology on a daily basis and has watched this space day in, day out, you know, since 2017. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. And on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step from start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's talk about this trend that I'm seeing in the Web 3.0 space right now. And that's Web 3.0 going mobile. So we're seeing a confluence of different ecosystems developing mobile first experiences for crypto and actually shipping hardware like the Solana mobile phone, all right, debut Saga, a flagship Android phone for Web3. We're seeing Ethereum OS, okay, the first uh, Ethereum operating system. And also, you know, Ethereum scaling solution Polygon uh, partnering with other mobile phone creators to build a Web 3.0 phone as well. Now, I don't think it's an accident that we're seeing all these different players come together about the same time and, you know, release these mobile first experiences for Web 3.0. So I think this trend has a ton of potential. I want to analyze some of that in depth in this video and I'll talk about some doubts that you might have about why someone would even use a blockchain based phone in the first place. So let's use this example to talk about, you know, how, you know, mobile could be a game changer for Web 3.0 and how it could gain adoption. So this is for ethereumphone.org. All right. So this is actually an operating system that you can install on Android based phones. That's the world's first Ethereum OS. We're going to look at some of the features uh, that are available on this operating system and talk about how that could be big for Web3 mobile adoption. Now, full disclosure, I have not used this. I've not personally vetted this project. So I'm not necessarily recommending that you download and install this. Uh, software just yet because I have no affiliation with them. It's not like a sponsored video or anything. I'm just using this as an example to show where this trend could head. So what does this do? Well, we'll look at some of the features first, and then we'll talk about the benefits and why that could be big for Web 3.0. So it offers native dApps on the actual operating system itself. It doesn't take any platform fees whenever you use these decentralized applications. It also lets you have a light node, so an actual blockchain-based node running on your device, which is pretty crazy. We'll talk about that here in a minute crypto native payments, and also ENS integration. So those are some of the features, but let's talk about the benefits that you can get out of a mobile first, you know, Web3 experience. So I think one of the biggest benefits is just really unlocking Web 3.0's full potential. So all the benefits that you can think of you know, out of Web 3.0, like trustlessness, transparency, decentralization, uh, and also like owning your own data. Let's talk about that one. That's pretty big how mobile can actually unlock that specific use case. Because, you know, a vast majority of people spend a lot of time on their on their mobile phones, okay, rather than just their desktop. In many ways, it's kind of clunky to experience Web 3.0 on mobile. But if you're doing most of your life on mobile, then that's a key part of owning your own data. So what does that mean? So one of the biggest problems with Web 2.0 right now is that whenever you do something, you, know, you sign up for a website, they take in all your any identity information, that's just stored in a server. But how can you actually t take more ownership over your own data in a Web 3.0 paradigm? Well, the key is not necessarily to take that data and put it on a blockchain because that's not any better, right? All the information is public. So how do you retain your own identity? Well, it's to keep all the information on your device and only provide it when uh, you are explicitly consenting to do that. So essentially, if you could have a phone where you could keep all your identity data on your phone itself, and the only time that you could share that information is when someone else is actually requesting it and you consent to it, then that's a big step in the right direction. And, you know, you need a way to do that where it's not synced on somebody's central server, and mobile's a pretty good way to start. And you might say, well, that sounds all good, but you could even do that right now. You don't need a blockchain to make that happen. You could just have an, you know, you could have an iPhone that just stores all your identity information, and then the only time you provide it on, you know, Facebook is whenever the site expressly asks for it and then they just take that and store their own server. Well, there's a few ways that blockchain can make that problem better. And one is actually, you know, using private key management on the device itself to authenticate that you are you. So that is the next part is identity management and actually your phone becoming really your own hardware wallet. That's kind of the next big benefit. So we'll kind of explain that. So right now, you know, people are using hardware wallets to protect themselves on crypto, like where they're, you know, using MetaMask to sign transactions, but again, they have this extra little dongle they plug in their computer that they must, you know, click a button on in order to, you know, double confirm that transaction. And so in this case, your phone really becomes your hardware wallet. So you could have a situation where your private key is just stored on your device. 
And the only time that you can actually sign a transaction is if you do some sort of biometric authentication, whether it's a fingerprint or a facial recognition or something like that, or maybe a backup, uh, you know, passcode, something like that, right? And so, uh, you know, you can have it where your private key is stored on the device, never leaves, and then you have to do everything on the phone to, to make that happen. And so the digital signature is the key part that authenticates that you are you that separates this from a web 2.0 context. And another way that you can make this better with blockchain without people just like taking your data whenever you decide to consent to it is using zero knowledge based proof cryptography to where you just have to prove that certain information is true, but you don't actually have to provide what the information itself is. So let's say you wanted to keep your identity completely on your mobile device, but then you wanted to prove that you were of a certain age in order to do something online. Well, essentially, you could just prove that all right, and not actually reveal what that information is. There's no way that somebody could take that data and then like stick it on your server. All right, so next big thing I want to talk about here is how this phone can potentially run a local light node on the device itself, because this is a really big part of decentralization. So the best case scenario for running a truly decentralized, you know, ecosystem is where you have more people participating in actually running the blockchain infrastructure itself, and then actually signing transactions directly with their own self-hosted nodes. Now, that's not really the reality we live in for most of most people using the blockchain right now, most people are using their wallet like MetaMask, connect to a browser, and then they connect to somebody else's node in order to access the blockchain. Again, the blockchain is just a peer-to-peer network of nodes or computers that all talk to one another. And in order to use the blockchain, you have to connect to a node. Now, you can run your own node, which is pretty cumbersome for a lot of people, or you can just use a self-hosted node like Infura or Alchemy in order to access any you know Ethereum-based uh, or EVM-compatible you know, chain. This is different because you can run a light node, which is not a full node. It's just a, a, a simpler, more lightweight, you know, hence light node on your device itself and actually on a mobile device, which is huge. Now, initially, I'm a little bit skeptical about this implementation because, you know, that's a pretty resource intensive task. And I'm curious to see how that works for battery life on a phone. But if they're able to pull this off, and that's a huge leap in the right direction for the actual Web 3.0 vision of decentralization and actually decentralizing the clients on people's devices where they don't have to trust, you know, a third party node software. Okay, so the other big thing is about these native dApps. So basically, you know, dApps are powered by smart contracts in the blockchain. If you can connect the smart contract, anybody can build a user interface for them. And having native dApps uh, where you can just have the applications on your computer that talk directly to the blockchain smart contracts, uh, that's going to be big because it's going to be much faster, snappier user experience than using a website through a browser. And also, it's cool that they have 0% platform fees. So they're not upcharging you to use those applications. So you're actually incentivized to use, you know, maybe user applications that are on the device rather than access them directly uh, from third party sites. Okay, so those are some reasons why, you know, Web 3.0 on a mobile device like this could be a pretty big deal. And another big deal is like the incentives for actually using this. Okay, like we might see special incentives for people to get special airdrops who have, you know, got one of these phones or, you know, maybe had this operating system installed. This could be a, literally a situation where a phone pays for itself or actually makes you more money over the long terms by having it. So we could even have people, you know, sign up for second phones, even if they decide not to switch their operating system or their phone in the first place. So let, that brings us to my next point, which is are the doubts. So what, what, what are some reasons why this might not actually work? like we think, but what are some potential answers to that? So the first is a switching cost. So, you know, me personally, like I'm a pretty hardcore iPhone user and, uh, you know, the switching cost of just trading in my phone and then using Android so that I can install a special operating system on it or like buying the Solana phone to use that, like th- there's not a huge incentive for me personally to do that, okay? So, you know, what are the answers to that? Well, you know, there could be the incentives like I was talking about, people to actually have a second phone that runs this type of stuff. Maybe they buy a used phone and install this operating system on it, or maybe they buy like a Solana phone and it ends up paying for itself with like airdrops or something like that. And they're able to just use this as a crypto native thing. And maybe it's even like a hardware wallet. You know what I mean? Like maybe we have this new category. You know, everybody, we had the iPod before we had the iPhone and people were like, okay, we've got this, we've got a, you know, a Palm Pilot and a handspring visor, all these PDA personal data assistants. We got PDA, all these like personal digital assistants. And that all eventually just merged into the phone. It could be some type of thing where we have these like hardware wallets and you have the second device and maybe there's this new category created out of it or maybe it all eventually ends up merging back into a phone that is crypto native like this. But what's also another answer to that? So, um, you know, one answer to this could be that Web 3.0 mobile first experience definitely is a trend. We're headed in that direction for all the reasons I talked about in this video, but maybe a unique 
device, right, or a unique operating system is not necessarily the answer, but the answer is, you know, wallet support, some sort of SDK inside of existing operating systems that people already use and have network effects. Essentially making a crypto native wallet inside of an Android device or the Android operating system and also inside of iOS, okay, where you can basically do the private key management like I was talking about to do digital signatures where people can store their own data inside a device that never leaves the device, whether it's the biometric authentication or any other data that they want to self-custody themselves. And then once you have that you know, layer baked into it, we have SDKs that let developers build apps that actually talk to that part of the operating system and actually use the blockchain. So basically not operating systems, new operating systems, but actually applications themselves. And each of those individual apps can do exactly what I was talking about in this video, with something like the ETH OS that you can see here, where you have like native dApps, okay, that have fast snap user experiences that charge 0% platform fees. Uh, maybe you have a situation where you can run a local light node inside your device, although maybe that one's, you know, less important than some of the other cases. But you could also have crypto native payments, you know, ENS integration, like they're talking about here. You could do identity management and everything with a slightly different implementation that leads to less switching costs for users, but still has a lot of incentive for them to adopt it with less friction. All right, so what does all this mean for the future of crypto? So again, it does a lot of people watching this space just going like, hey, you know, what are the next big catalysts that can fuel this next wave of crypto adoption? Because, you know, cryptocurrency bull runs and hype cycles are highly correlated to new technology hitting the space. And I think a lot of people are just sitting on the sidelines not saying like, hey, this crypto thing's dead. They're saying, I think this thing's gonna jump you know, in our next wave, I'm just waiting to see what's going to make it do that. So is Web 3.0 the next big catalyst? So the answer, in my opinion, is that it could be one of the things that helps do that. Okay. So like whenever we saw, you know, early blockchain use cases hit the scene in like 2018, 2019, I was here, we had NFTs, we had tokens, we had, you know, DeFi starting to emerge, especially in 2019. And so we had all these seeds that were sown and really one started to pop off before the other, right? We kind of had DeFi make its first initial burst on the scene. Then like, like NFTs kind of came later. And then we saw things like gaming metaverse, right? It's, it's kind of this cycle of things that, that goes through. And so in my opinion, like if we can see mobile really start to mature in the way that I've talked about in this video, maybe even see, you know, integrations into major operating systems like iOS and Android, and maybe even have alternatives where you have complete operating systems where you could do it yourself. And then you start to develop this really rich mobile ecosystem where they have incentives for people to actually install this stuff on their, on their own devices, especially if there's some sort of financial incentive behind it, then that definitely could be one of the things that creates this snowball effect for the next big wave of crypto adoption. Because I personally don't think it's a question of if, it's really just a question of when, and ultimately, it takes time for that technology to get created. But we're seeing a lot of momentum in the right direction. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people learn about blockchain. You know, if you're as fast at this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step by step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.